Welcome to the Damascus Road Podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. Have you ever played Animal Crossing? During the pandemic, it was one of my favorite games to play. If you haven't experienced it yet, Animal Crossing is a game by Nintendo where you build up an uninhabited island into a thriving village full of animals. It's incredibly whimsical and adorable. If you need proof, just look at this guy. His name is Kevin. He's a jock pig who works out constantly and he's obsessed with being my best friend. Now, the way this game works is that once you beat the main task over the course of a few months, you are given free reign to terraform and remake your island however you want. Uh, terraforming means you can change the landscaping where the lakes and rivers are, or you can change land into different levels and make it different colors. On top of that, you can build bridges and move buildings wherever you want. People who play this game use this feature to make amazing and unique islands, like my friend Francis, who made a Pride and Prejudice themed island. But when I got to this part of the game, the freedom to step outside of the box is a huge logical roadblock for me. Unlike many of my friends who have successfully terraformed, I've only been able to make small changes. In fact, I think it worked looks worse than when I started. Eventually, I just gave up. I was so good at staying on task, doing things like making money and searching for animals. That stuff made sense to me. Um, that was normal. But now I've been given the ability to terraform, and I have no idea what to do. Terraforming is a lot more effort, and I kind of want to go back to the way things were before. Back to when me and Kevin were just taking it easy, doing push-ups in the sand. Now, I usually consider myself a creative person, so it really messed with my head when I couldn't imagine how to design my island. Have you ever felt like this? Like you wanted to create something amazing, but you didn't know how because you were so used to what was normal? Maybe you've had an experience in life where the world around you became so familiar that you forgot how moldable it is. Our lives can seem so normal, that we struggle to imagine breaking the rules and creating something different. Maybe your normal sounds something like this. I'm so bored with my work, but it pays the bills, so why should I complain? I'm so stressed and tired, but so is everyone else. That's just what you gotta do if you wanna get ahead. I haven't seen my friends in weeks, but social media makes me feel less lonely, so I'll keep on scrolling. I can't bring myself to watch the news anymore, because everyone is always fighting, that's just the way the world is. There's a famous parable by author David Foster Wallace you may have heard of. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks over to the other and goes, what the heck is water? Well, what is it? If we are the fish in this story, what are we swimming in that we aren't even aware of? Like, why does everyone in America drive cars when obviously we could be riding in trains? Whose great-grandfathers decided that this should be our mode of transportation because they obviously didn't consult any young children who are smart enough to know that trains are superior? Or why do 77% of Americans only speak English when bilingual education is more available than ever? And why do different states get better access to education? Why is there an island of garbage in the Pacific twice the size of Texas? And why, why on earth is Columbus Day still a holiday? The list of what is normal goes on and on and on. And I doubt that any of us are ignorant to the unsavory elements of our culture. Our community is full of passionate people who advocate for righteousness all the time. I think we already do so many amazing things that reflect the kingdom of God, but when I really think about it, there are a lot of things that we've become accustomed to that don't actually have to stay that way. We've all been shaped by this world around us and have adapted to live in it the best that we can. And this isn't always a bad thing. Adapting is how we survive. It's also not our responsibility to heal every single thing about the world. That's up to God. Even though we can make a huge difference, we cannot fix all the world's problems. It has been broken for thousands of years, and I'm not about to have all the answers by the end of this message. But I'm tired of acting like what is normal is okay. 
If humanity has been given the responsibility to steward the earth, then why do we keep treating it this way? And why don't things seem to get better? Isn't there another way? Doesn't God have a plan for these things? I think that God does have a plan. Unwrapper and author of Propaganda thinks the key is to embrace our role in terraforming our world to look more like the kingdom of God. He puts it this way. What if we applied the idea of terraforming to our world today? What if you could terraform the culture, your family, your inner world, and yourself? What if the interplanetary scientists and engineers were actually earthling artists, songwriters, and poets? Let me take the metaphor even further. What if we thought about our cultural climate in the same way we consider the actual climate, and the harvestable ground was actually represented by the ideas we plant in each other's hearts and minds? What if the air we breathe was represented by the songs, poems, and stories we sing over each other? What if our words created worlds? Now here's a gut punch. That's exactly what we have been doing the whole time. We make culture, culture makes us, rinse and repeat. We can change the world around us. We can see it terraform. And the truth is our lives are already creating the world around us. Over this new series, we're gonna dive into this idea of intentional transformation. How do we shape culture and our world by how we live? And what can we do to shape it in a way that honors Jesus? So let's get started. How do we terraform our world and our lives? Well, to begin, let's try to figure out what exactly is this water that we're swimming in. Let's take a survey of the cultural climate before we try to change it. Sociologist Brian Streamsland defines it this way. The term culture can mean the cultivation associated with civilized habits of mind, the creative products associated with the arts or the entire way of life associated with a group. Among sociologists, culture just as often refers to the beliefs that people hold about reality, the norms that guide their behavior, the values that orient their moral commitments, or the symbols through which these beliefs, norms, and values are communicated. Basically, it's the behavior and systems of our society that were created to accomplish that society's goals. Everything around us was once made up by someone and eventually became our culture. For better or for worse, these things make us who we are. Now, culture can often feel like this giant monolith that we're fighting against. Things are just the way that they are. It's easy to recognize this direction of culture as top-down. People in power making choices that make a culture that the proletariat conform to. But the magical thing about culture is that it works in reverse as well. Culture is made by people making choices, and we are people who make choices. The ways that we love our families, the way we treat nature, the products we consume, even down to the small ideas we talk about among friends can contribute to making the culture. And the Bible affirms too that we, the people, are the ones who help make the culture. The Bible tells us that our capacity for change is not reliant on our power or prestige, but simply our willingness to follow Christ. Jesus knew the impact of ordinary people when he spoke to the masses in the Sermon on the Mount. To ordinary people, he said, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. We are the light and we are the culture. So why not make it amazing? Why not make earth the way it is in heaven? This invitation to terraform is integral to the Christian life and also to who we are as a church. This is DR's mission statement. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. How awesome is that? As the church, each of us are growing, transforming, developing, and continuing the work Jesus started. We are terraforming. This is beautiful and important work. Now, when I was little, I was often given the message, you can do anything, you can change the world. This is an encouraging thing to tell small children and in a larger sense, it is true. We can make an impact. We can terraform our earth so it looks a little bit more like heaven. But the way people uh, think we go about changing the world is often a bit narcissistic and separated from the reality of how transformation works. We are told that we are powerful, 
But we, what we aren't used to hearing is that our external world looks the way it does because of our internal worlds. When we try to form the culture, it will look like us. Culture is just the choices people make over time, so it inherently reflects people. We need to take a look in the mirror before we make something we don't understand. It would be reckless of me to tell you to go and change everything in the world right now, and the second, right now the second in the name of the kingdom, because we ourselves are probably more misaligned from the kingdom than we would like to admit. Paul gives us some advice for terraforming here. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Paul's instructions here have an order to them. Be transformed, then learn to know God's will. We have to remember that transformation starts on the inside by the renewal of our minds. This has to be the first step because the character of who we are will be the blueprint to what we create. Then as we are transformed, we can come to know God's will for us. God transforms us so we can transform the world. When we are connected to the creator, growth and beauty becomes second nature. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. The connection to the vine is the most important aspect of transformation. We really don't need to act in urgency or desperation to make an impact right now. What we need to do is to abide in Christ and let him transform us. Instead of straining ourselves, thinking about how to make fruit, we need to think like plants do and grow some deep roots. I really love propaganda's metaphor that the ideas that develop in our hearts are like seeds of a garden. Jesus constantly talked about the kingdom of God with garden imagery. In Mark, he says, Jesus said, how can I describe the kingdom of God? What story should I use to illustrate it? It is like a mustard seed planted in the ground. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it, come, it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It grows long branches and birds can make nests in its shade. The seed of the kingdom starts small, gets planted in our hearts, and it grows from there into the largest of plants. Propaganda poses the question, what if our words created worlds? What if the ideas we planted in our hearts could change the cultural climate? If this is true, then the word of God is our greatest tool in terraforming. Seeds of God's love start in us and become interwoven into everything that we create. Then God's love changes our hearts. It is the start Sorry, when God's love changes our hearts, it's the start of great change in our societies as well. We know that we are building the kingdom of God when we see the fruit of the Spirit growing in our work. A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. We have to start looking at the fruit that we are creating to find its root. Then we can start to separate what is good from what is rotten. If the words of Jesus don't lead to any real love, compassion, or conviction, then it has no real roots in our hearts because we know that the seeds of God's word grow good fruit. The difference between kingdom building and blind activism is treating everyone and everything with care and dignity. If we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death to life, but a person who has no love is still dead. So I encourage you to reflect on what areas of your internal world need to be transformed. Ask yourself, what's working? What parts of you feel alive? What parts of you feel full of peace, patience, gentleness, and self-control? And also ask, what isn't working? What is causing you to hate others? What is making you feel hopeless, afraid, or ashamed? How can you maybe slow down so you can pay attention to your thoughts and your behavior? Uh, this is James 1. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. 
So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. According to James, righteousness means training ourselves to listen more than we talk. Before we can tear from the culture, we need to be aware of ways our own hearts are keeping us from loving. We have to be silent long enough to be aware of the brokenness in our own hearts and accept that we need God's wisdom. James also says, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace loving, gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. So does the life we're creating here produce peace and righteousness? Does it honor people equally or does it show favoritism? Does it fight to be right or does it yield to others? Is it pure or is it somehow corrupted by the sins of the past? Unfortunately, we are often unaware of how much sin has shaped our culture and therefore ourselves. Seeds of pride, discrimination, and apathy have been growing in and around us unchecked. So if we want to start growing good fruit in our society, we need to detangle ourselves from what is rotten. Living this way will often make us seem really strange to others. Even though I would never join the Amish in their isolated commitment to simple living, <clears throat> there's something about refusing to conform that I really respect. Like Charlotte Bronte wrote in Jane Eyre, conventionality is not morality. I had a friend in college who refused to get an iPhone because he knew it would distract him. When I first found out about this, I thought he was being ridiculous and quite boring. <laughs> I kept trying to convince him how fun phones were, um, but he stayed committed to his flip phone and he wasn't bored. Actually, he was always the life of the party. He was always so attentive to all of our friends and he spent so much time reading his Bible because he had so much more time than the rest of us. He was really committed to being transformed from the inside out and choosing to avoid the bad fruit of addictive technology. Um, eventually he got a phone for work, but I would bet real money that he doesn't use social media. Uh, living differently has always been a part of the Christian life, even within the community itself. Abolitionists, suffragists, and environmental activists at one point all seemed like crazy outsiders, but their commitment to righteousness has grown into our hearts as well. Their faithfulness and resistance to sin have helped us grow in compassion for one another too. Now, maybe you're listening to this thinking, really, like, this is how we change the world with ideas? By doing some soul searching and rooting out our sin, by connecting to the vine and spending time with Jesus, by becoming gentle, patient, and slow to anger? Shouldn't we be doing more? Taking it to the streets? This all feels really inactive and like it's not actually solving any real problems out there. Um, and that's a totally fair point. We need to bully act on our cultural convictions if you want to see any real change. And we're going to be talking about how to make those changes all throughout this series. But I think it's too easy to look at the culture and point out all of the problems within it without ever acknowledging our own sin. We are the culture. Choosing to look inward is not only necessary, it's the most radical, Christ-like thing you can do. In Sky Jathani's book, What If Jesus Was Serious, he writes... Jesus affirms the world-shaping value of ordinary people who follow the ways of an extraordinary God. It isn't that he expected each person to change the world through remarkable accomplishments. Rather, Jesus expected his undistinguished followers to be the source of the world's most essential ingredients. Pliny, who lived in the first century, commented that there is nothing more useful in the world than salt and sunshine. Likewise, in a dark, deteriorating world, there is nothing more wonderful than simple people living as Jesus taught. Through simple acts of intentional living, rewriting patterns of sin, choosing obedience over comfort, and loving our enemies, we are building the kingdom of God. When we swim against the current, we help to answer each other's prayers for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And to be clear, the point of terraforming isn't to condemn anyone. We are all guilty of sin, and we are all offered forgiveness. The goal here isn't to say, look at how terrible the world is, but rather to say, look at all the things God can help us with. God doesn't call us to be hopeless. He's calling us to be imaginative. Propaganda says, I want to challenge you to tell better stories, not only about yourself, 
but about the people around you, to see the land not only as a resource, but as a family member, a gift, the very first way the divine revealed itself, to allow your imagination to wander into areas you didn't even think were possible, to build a livable world. So this is a huge topic. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be diving deep into many areas of life that God cares deeply about. Uh, throughout the series, we're going to be learning to tell better origin stories, to be honest about the past. Uh, we're going to learn how the soil is sacred and start rethinking the way we measure value. We're going to start talking about resisting the empire and rejecting the fear of scarcity with institutional neighborliness. Uh, we're going to talk about peace as we remember the quiet, because how are we supposed to change the world if we can't hear our own thoughts? Um, and lastly, we're going to imagine a better future. Kingdom thinking means imagining outside the bounds of this reality and stepping into the multiverse. There's a lot here because uh, the possibilities of terraforming are endless. Um, this is not an all-encompassing series. It's just the start of the conversation. But before we go there, we have to start small. Propaganda starts his book with this small poem. Last night, I asked Normal, how come you never have to explain yourself? She sighed, looked a little frightened. I was just about to ask you the same question. So to apply this idea, I want us to generate two lists. There are note cards uh, with pens available um, here at DR. You can grab the notes app on your phone if that works best for you. Um, first, I want you to start by addressing the first half of Propaganda's poem. Last night, I asked Normal, how come you never have to explain yourself? So start by making a list of what's normal. Make a list of things that, in your view, our world has normalized that maybe shouldn't be normal. What things make you say, it doesn't have to be this way? It could be something about partisan politics, public transportation, education, the television industry, factoring pharma, factory farming, etc. It could even be something small, like why don't women's clothes have sufficient pockets? Try to fill the whole front side of your card. I'm sure you won't struggle to fill it. Then I want you to flip your card over and make another list, this time addressing the second half of Propaganda's poem. She sighed, looked a little frightened. I was just about to ask you the same question. If culture is made by people, we are some of those people, and we need to think critically about our own internal worlds that we project into the world. What are some things in your thought life, your values, your practices, your attitudes, your beliefs that seem normal to you because it's just the way it's always been, but that maybe don't align with Jesus' character or God's kingdom? As you work on your list, I'm going to talk about some things on my own. For the first list, I've personally been trying to keep myself from valuing written communication more than oral communication. For many reasons, we just don't trust oral history as much. We don't find it reliable or consistent. We don't pass down stories like we used to. We don't memorize anything, not even phone numbers. In fact, we barely even call each other anymore, always preferring a text message. We keep information on the surface, trusting the internet to tell us what's what, not realizing how little we trust our ability to remember. Why is this normal? There's also a lot of historical significance to why this is true. Until I read this book, I had never been aware of how much the hierarchy of written communication over oral communication has been used to aid our nation's history of colonism, uh, colonialism and slavery. Individuals and institutions throughout America's history have intentionally tried to lead society to only trust written communication because if it was written down, it was probably approved by someone in power. If it was printed, you could trust it. But this hierarchy degraded the value of stories that couldn't be written down. It silenced those who were unable to write in English and later from those who could be censored. Early settlers' treaties with Native American tribes were broken ruthlessly because they said that verbal treaties weren't valid. The history of their people wasn't written down, so colonist rhetoric used this fact to try to prove that they were uncivilized, even though they have a rich oral history. There's also the history of how black slaves were kept from literacy so that they couldn't write down their stories of resistance to oppression. But they did tell their stories. We have them preserved in the oral histories that they passed on to their children and their grandchildren. And we can hear these stories in the songs they wrote that became the backbone of American gospel, jazz, and rock and roll. I'm telling this story to highlight how something really normal can be rooted in sin. 
I'm not gonna throw away my computer or my pens anytime soon. I'm just starting to think about communication very differently. This concept has made me aware of the fact that the vast majority of the information I know about other cultures is written by people who are not from those cultures. Most of the books I've read are only from white voices, and for a long time I never thought to ask why that was normal. Uh, but now I am asking why, and I'm trying to terraform my library one book at a time. And I got an Audible subscription so I can hear authors read their books, and I think it's so special to hear their voices. My personal book collection isn't ultimately the solution to these giant problems, but the seed of change is growing in me. An idea a fellow Christian said eventually reached me, and grew into my mind, and it changed the way I engage with literature, and I think that's amazing. So how are your lists coming along? Good. Awesome. Part of the terraforming work is starting to simply pay attention. What is our expectation of normal, and what could be different? Writing the first side shouldn't be too hard, but the personal side of the list is probably going to be more difficult. For my list, I think something that is really normal for me is to get really upset when people give me negative feedback. It's pretty normal for most of the world to be bad at this. I used to just try to stay calm during stressful meetings, and then go home and cry later. Uh, this was the best case scenario, if I'm being honest. The worst cases included being mean, defensive, and seriously distrusting people who were just trying to give me advice. I've always known this part of my life felt really bad, but I didn't realize it could be different. But I'm starting to work on this now, and I'm a lot more hopeful about it because I think it's something that can be terraformed. It's very life-giving for me to know that God wants to help me grow in this area and that it doesn't have to be normal. So I hope you've gotten a good start to your list, and I encourage you to just keep thinking about this as the series goes on. Next, I encourage you to start listening. Listen to the Word of God every day and meditate on it so that it can grow into your mind and into your life. Join a Bible reading plan or just start with one book and keep going from there. My favorite books of the Bible to read are 1 John and James, if you're looking for a place to start. Fill your mind with beautiful and truthful words that will help you to start seeing the world the way Jesus does. Uh, this is Philippians 4, 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. We can also listen to Christian authors, foreign authors, and authors from minority groups who can teach us about the reality of the world we're dealing with. When we listen before we speak, we are opening our internal worlds up to flourishing. Listening as a practice helps us grow in humility. We need humility to admit that maybe we don't always know what's best. We have to accept that our forefathers also didn't know what was best, and neither did their fathers. All of humanity needs God's help if we want to make Earth the way it is in heaven. Uh, it can be really intimidating to start to think about all these topics, but I think it's also really exciting. There is hope and beauty and bravery in recognizing our need for God. We need his wisdom and the power of his love in our hearts and in our homes and in our streets. That wisdom that we so desperately need is not far away. It's right here in God's word and in his Holy Spirit that is always with us. To terraform is to be radically hopeful, to work for a better future, because we know that sin and brokenness does not get the last word. We are continuing the good work that Jesus started, and we know that one day it will be finished. Jesus was the word, and he gave us the words that we can have peace and life and hope for the future. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Um, dear God, we're so grateful for all of these ideas that we're starting to think about. We thank you for the word that you've given us to help us grow. Um, we're so grateful that you care, that you care about all the things that break our hearts and that hurt us. Um, we know that we're not alone as we start the journey of terraforming. Um, and God, we just want to make this world the way you created it. You want to sustain what you've given us. Um, just pray you be with us as we do it. We love you so much, God. Um, Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road Podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, 
loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at DamascusRoadTucson.com.